Hello, Ian Jameson here, and uh, it's lovely that you can join me to have a few moments aside in the Word of God today. I'd like to ask you to turn, please, to the little book of Jonah, to Jonah, please, and to chapter 2, one of the minor prophets, and uh, it's a book that I have um, a special place in my heart for. I'll tell you why in a moment. I hope that you're keeping safe and well. And I hope that you're not finding this ongoing lockdown situation just too much of a trial, too hard, too difficult. I know that we're all in different situations. Some people are experiencing the ease of lockdown um, and uh, restrictions being lifted a little. And others, because of circumstance or health, are still very much confined to their own homes. And I hope that whatever circumstance you find yourself in, that you're just aware of God's goodness and his love. And also that you're finding nourishment in the wonderful word of God. So I'd like to ask you please then to turn to Jonah and to chapter 2. I have a special love for this book for two reasons. One is that it's the only book of the Bible I've ever memorised. I wish I could tell you that it was for a spiritual uh, and noble reason, but actually um, I was a theological student at the University of St Andrews and I took courses there in Hebrew and Greek and I found Hebrew a real struggle. It was a real challenge academically and uh, I had an exam coming up and I knew that there was going to be a translation passage in that exam and it was going to be from the book of Jonah and so uh, I found translation very difficult and I thought well if I memorize the book of Jonah in English then when it comes to the exam if I can work out what the first few words uh, are in the passage and the last few words then I can remember what's in the middle and translate from memory. Not a very noble reason I should have just learned my Hebrew I think but um, there we are. The second reason is that Jonah and I have something in common in that when I was six years old I placed my faith and trust in Jesus Christ as my saviour and was born again and it happened in the bath and my mum led me in the prayer of salvation but for some reason I got nervous and I held my nose and went right underneath the bath water until my head was completely submerged by the bath water and there I placed my faith and trust in Jesus and so Jonah and I and were both saved underwater so I have a particular affinity uh, with uh, Jonah. Jonah chapter 2 then, and this has got to be one of the most remarkable prayers in our Bibles, a prayer prayed by a desperate man, by a disobedient prophet from the belly of a great fish. And the lesson that Jonah is learning, the central lesson, is the last statement of his prayer. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Jonah is a book all about salvation. The sailors in that boat headed to Tarshish from Joppa, they're saved when Jonah is cast into the sea. We then find that Jonah is saved through the miraculous intervention of God directing this great fish. And then we find that the people of Nineveh too, that great godless Gentile city, um, are saved because they repent at the preaching of Jonah. We include Jonah in the Minor Prophets, and yet, um, although it's a prophecy and a book about a prophet, it's primarily about God's dealings personally with the prophet himself. Jonah points forward to our Lord Jesus and uh, in Matthew's Gospel and elsewhere in Luke's Gospel, the Lord refers back to Jonah um, when it comes to his resurrection. Uh, three days and three nights in the belly of the fish, three days and three nights in the tomb. But the actual prophetic content of Jonah is very limited. Chapter 3 and verse 4, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. That's all that we have in the book of Jonah that is directly prophetic at the time. Yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And yet that message was God's message for those people for that time. And they did repent and were saved. So we're learning in Jonah that salvation belongs to the Lord. Jonah knew what lockdown was all about, didn't he? Uh, there in the belly of that great fish in the Mediterranean Sea. We're going to read this prayer uh, together, so expressive of a man experiencing uh, a dreadful lockdown. He was in there for just three days and three nights, and we've been in lockdown for almost three months, and yet I'd still rather have our experience than his. Let's read this together. Jonah chapter 2 verse 1. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish, saying, I called out to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. Out of the, of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the floods surrounded me. All your waves and your billows passed over me. And then a very in interesting statement. Then I said, I am driven away from your sight. I am driven away from your sight. 
friends, it's good for us to remember that that's what Jonah asked for. That's what he wanted. Look back at chapter 1 and verse 3. So he paid the fare and went on board to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. Or so he thought. How impossible it is, of course, to flee from the presence of the Lord. It's something that cannot be done. And yet he thought that if he was to go off to this port in Spain, uh, the distant far end of the Mediterranean Sea, that perhaps he would get away from God's claims and demands upon his life. And yet, of course, that wasn't to be the case. I am driven away from your sight. Well, Jonah, that's what you wanted. And then this amazing assurance that he expresses in the second half of chapter 2 and verse 4. Yet I shall again look upon your holy temple. The waters closed in over me to take my life. The deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped about my head at the roots of the mountains. I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever. I wonder if you can identify with Jonah's experience here. Here are the words of a man who feels completely and utterly overwhelmed. A man who cannot cope. He is at the deepest point. He has sunk down to the very depths and here he is in the belly of this great fish, feeling that he is right down in the very depths of despair. And yet what comes next is this, yet you brought up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. When my life was fainting away, I remembered the Lord and my prayer came to you into your holy temple. What remarkable truth that is about prayer. You know, we are all separated one from the other. We're all isolated in our own homes. And yet prayer is unaffected. Prayer is unaffected by our location, by our geography. We don't need to be in our buildings, in our churches, of course, to pray. We pray where we are, in our own rooms, in our own homes. And prayer reaches the throne room of heaven. If it can do so from the belly of a fish, it can do so from our houses and homes. And my prayer came to you into your holy temple. Those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love. Perhaps he was thinking there of the, the sailors that he was with uh, just before on his journey to Tarshish. And they had cried out to their gods, idols of wood and stone. And yet he knows the God of Israel, the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. But with the voice, uh, But I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will pay. And then this wonderful conclusion, the key to the book of Jonah, really, salvation belongs to the Lord. And the Lord spoke to the fish and it vomited Jonah out upon the dry land. Well, that, I think, is the central verse. Salvation belongs to the Lord. There are two things I just want to say about this chapter and what it teaches us. And uh, two very simple observations. One is that God saves helpless sinners. God saves helpless sinners. And the second is that God sends helpless servants. He sends helpless servants. I don't know everybody who will be watching these videos. And it may well be that there could be somebody who's watching this video who doesn't know the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Saviour. That you've never placed your trust and your faith in him. If so, then I would encourage you. I would plead with you to do so today without any further delay to place your trust in Jesus for salvation there is only one saviour for all sinners for all time and Jonah had to learn this of course Jonah was one who already knew the Lord he was a disobedient prophet and yet what this does teach us is that no matter who you are no matter what you have done and no matter where you find yourself today God can save you and if you place your faith and trust in Jesus Christ for salvation you will be saved. Those who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, we read in the book of Romans. And nobody has ever been refused. The Lord Jesus Christ does not turn anyone away. So no matter what you have done, uh, who you are or where you find yourself today, you can be saved. The Lord Jesus Christ came to seek and to save that which was lost. He came for people who are disobedient. He came for the sinner. We must learn that salvation belongs to the Lord. We cannot save ourselves by our own efforts or by our own merits, but we can only rely on the Lord Jesus Christ to be our saviour. The second thing is that God only sends helpless servants. God could have intervened uh, in Jonah. 
at different points throughout the book. He could have arrested him after his refusal to go to Nineveh and he could have taken Jonah and turned him round and forced him to Nineveh. God could have stopped him on his way to go down to Joppa and turned him round and made him go back home. God could have stopped the boat on its way out of uh, the harbour of Joppa. God could have calmed the sea but the way that God works here is that he takes Jonah down to the lowest point and teaches him this valuable lesson that salvation belongs to the Lord. Who else could have saved Jonah? In the belly of a great fish at the bottom of the Mediterranean Sea, who else could have inter intervened for his salvation? He had to learn that only God could save him. It was a lesson that he had to learn in order to be uh, an effective prophet for the Lord. And of course, even then, it was a lesson he failed to learn totally. He failed to learn that salvation is God's prerogative alone because in chapters 3 and 4 we read about Jonah's displeasure at the mercy of God expressed towards those godless Gentiles in Nineveh. He needed to remind himself and ought to have done that salvation belongs to the Lord. It's a divine prerogative. It's God who saves. Well, God sent him. God still had a work for him to do. And those few words of prophecy that we read about in chapter 3 were used by God to bring a whole great city to repentance. It's an encouraging thought. It's a, something that gives every believer in the Lord Jesus hope because Jonah is such an, an unpromising character. Jonah is a, a disobedient prophet, a man who has tried to flee from the presence of God and yet God still has a work for him to do. Puts this in mind of, of Peter, doesn't it? Peter, after the Lord's resurrection and Peter is with the Lord at the seaside at the Sea of Galilee and the Lord asks him those three times lovest thou me and Peter is given that renewed commission to go and to feed my sheep well there was still a work for Peter to do and there was still a work for Jonah to do wasn't there a work that would bring a whole city to its knees in repentance there's hope for us in Jonah, for all of us who would seek to do even something small for the Lord Jesus Christ. I would like us to finish by turning to Paul's epistle to the Colossians, please, and chapter 1. Colossians and chapter 1. The people of Nineveh were Gentiles, and God chose Jonah and used him to prophesy to them and brought them to repentance. And uh, in this part of Colossians, we are dealing with this mystery that was hidden for ages and generations. Uh, verse 27 says this, To them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. And then verse 28 and 29 speak about God at work in our lives in his service. Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom, that we may present each one mature in Christ. For this I toil, struggling, that word is agonizemenos, agony, agonising, with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. Just notice this, that it's him we proclaim, that it's his energy with which we work, and that it's he who powerfully works within each one of us. The message is not ours, him we proclaim. The motivation is not ours, it's all his energy and the means are not ours at all, it's he that powerfully works within me. This was something that Jonah would learn. Salvation belongs to the Lord. What a wonderful truth that is. It doesn't belong to you or me, it's something that is a divine prerogative alone. Salvation belongs to the Lord. What a wonderful saviour we have, one who can save us to the uttermost when we are at the very depths and one who can use even those who have been disobedient, who have tried to flee from his presence. All of us as believers in the Lord Jesus, as servants of his, are failures in one way or another. And yet the Lord can use us and does use us. How gracious he is to us. Every blessing. Amen.